Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jiang Wu, Director of the Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Arizona. Today we're very glad to have an interview speaker here, and uh, she is uh, Patricia Graham, and uh, she's going to give us a talk this afternoon. But before the talk, we're, we're very happy to have her here with us to talk about her career and her thought about Japanese art and Asian art in general. Uh, she is a leading scholar in the field of Japanese art, and she has published widely in journals, catalogs, and the reference works. She has published uh, several major works. Uh, one of them is Face and uh, Power in Japanese Buddhist Art, and the other is uh, The Tea of the Sages, the Art of Sencha. And also, this is very special because uh, this is our first interview after the pandemic. And uh, yes, now we have uh, Pat Graham with us, and we're ha very happy, and welcome back to Tucson. Thank you. I love Tucson, and I'm very happy to be here and working with you on this project. It's quite exciting for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, you have published so much about early modern Japanese art, in particular obaku art. Uh, you have been doing research for uh, such a long time. And uh, uh, can you just introduce us a little bit about yourself? how you get into this field. There must be lots of stories about uh, doing research, traveling, and doing also uh, appraisal works, right? Yeah, so, so I, I started my career as a professor and then uh, was a museum curator and then decided at some point uh, almost 30 years ago to just do freelance consulting and also um, art appraising. Uh, and that way I can keep my hand in both academia and museum work and then also be involved with collectors and so forth. But I have a PhD from the University of Kansas and I actually went there to study Chinese art, in particular Chinese literati painting with Chu Tsing Li. And somehow when I got there, I got turned around and got really inspired to study Japanese art and it was quite fortuitous that a, a year or two after I got there, Steve Addis came and he was a leading young scholar at that time, he recently passed away, of a Japanese uh, literati painting, Nanga painting. And because of my interest in Chinese literati painting, I was drawn to what he was working on as well. And so I started working under him. And so that's how I got started in Japanese art. And since then I did, um, when I was working uh, twice, two stints working at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art as a curator of Japanese art. Um, I was a consultant for Japanese art. They didn't have a formal ongoing curatorial position, but that was basically what I did. So I started more broadly looking at lots of different types of Japanese art, which of course I had to study for my PhD as well. So I, that encouraged a lot of my research too from my, my work at the Nelson. Um, so my dissertation was on a literati painter named Yamamoto Baitsu, who was both a very fine painter. He lived from 1783 to 1856. And he was from Nagoya, but spent a lot of his career in Kyoto. Um, but he, in addition to being a, a wonderful painter, he was a collector of Chinese paintings and a Sencha tea master. And so out of my research on him, I developed specialties in Chinese collections of art in Japan, and that drew me to studying um, Chinese art imported through obaku channels, and then also the Sencha tea ceremony, which ultimately became my first book. And so that got me there. And then my work at the Nelson, uh, there was a painting there by a monkey painter, someone who's mostly known as a monkey painter named Mori Sosen, 
a late 18th century painter who did a very curious bust portrait of Shusan Shaka, Shakyamuni Buddha descending from the mountains. And it was so curious to me, why would a painter known for these realistic, naturalistic monkey paintings and other animal paintings do a portrait like that? And what did that mean um, for Buddhist art representation in the early modern period? And so I wrote a long article about that, and that again drew me to Obaku studies because the style of this painting went back to stylistic influences that came through the Obaku channels and the monks that were Obaku monks who brought this new, more realistic style from Ming China to Japan. So I got interested in that, and then that painting led me to my second book, which was Faith and Power in Japanese Buddhist Art. So I'll stop there if you have any more okay. questions wow. about uh, this. Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful journey and a very yeah. successful one. Yeah, yeah thank and you. And you mentioned about your books. I consult them quite frequently. Oh, right? thank it's you. why I wrote my book. I, I read your narrative very closely. It's really a very clear narrative about early modern Japanese art, in particular Obaku. You mentioned it a couple of times. Yeah. And, and that's the reason why we invited you here, yeah. right? Because this year is very special for the Obaku tradition. Here, what we mean by Obaku is a Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese term called Huangbo. And this tradition was founded by a Chinese monk called Yin Yuan Longqi. Uh, who went to Japan in uh, 1654 and the later founded the Mampukuji, so started the Obaku tradition. So his name in Japanese will be pronounced as Ingen Ryuki, right? Yeah. So the Japanese uh, love the Ingen Mame, right? So actually the Mame, Ingen Mame was named after this monk. Yeah. Right? So, so that's the piece of the uh, history. I think that's first intrigued you, right? So you start to write the books and also the Sencha tradition later today you're going to talk about. So that's the history of the Obaku tradition. And I said this year is so special because this year is the 350th death anniversary of uh, Master Ingen, right, Yin Yuan. Yeah. So we're as, here at the University of Arizona, our Center for Buddhist Studies is organizing a series of celebrations. Right. So one of them is an online exhibition. And we thank you so much for joining our advisory committee as a key person to design the exhibition, to maintain, to curate the exhibition. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be involved in this. And it's such, such important work, I think. Yeah, so, so let's talk, talk about our exhibition, right? Yeah, so this, yeah. Because this is a project we've been working for such a long time. And the, uh, by the way, the online exhibition is there at uh, ingen.arizona.edu, ingen.arizona.edu. So we can go there to, to look at the exhibitions, and we're going to do a major update pretty soon, right? And, and so far, Pat, uh, can you talk a little bit about this exhibition? What, what's your perspective, your, your thought about exhibition, and, and what's the Obaku art about? So, um I first became introduced to Obaku art from my dissertation advisor, Stephen Addis, who I mentioned. Um, and he did the very first exhibition in the West of Obaku art in 1978. And the one that you are doing here online, uh, which has a much broader audience than that first one because it is online. So people far and wide can see it, not just the people who came to that little exhibition that was tra the first one that traveled to New Orleans and the University of Kansas Spencer Museum of Art. So this is a really important exhibition. And um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of it. So I've been thinking about this Obaku arts for these many decades now. and. So the exhibition that you are doing is, I think, really important because it's trying to show the world how important obaku art is to understanding early modern Japanese art in general. And 
so much of Japanese early modern art studies do not focus so much on what was imported from China and more on the native traditions, the ukiyo-e tradition in particular, that's very, very popular, that spawned the prints that are collected worldwide by many, many thousands, and the paintings of ukiyo-e artists, and the, um, pub, uh, the, the native traditions more. But China played a very important role in the early modern period, and that's what I tried to do in my Sencha book, uh, to show that as a route for the influences. And also getting back to your exhibition, your exhibition is doing that as well. Um, it's, the exhibition is very well organized. It has several different sections right now that start with uh, Yin Yuan Ingen and his predecessors and his disciples and focused mainly on uh, the Obaku culture and the type of poetry and calligraphy that they wrote and what were the sayings that they wrote in their calligraphy. But also other sections of the exhibition show uh, poets and artists who were influenced by Obaku traditions. And one important tradition that came, that we focus on in the exhibition is uh, the arhats, the, uh, the um, rakan in Japanese, who are disciples of the Buddha, uh, legendary disciples of the Buddha, that became extremely popular in the early modern period and remain so in present day Japan. And it was largely through the Obaku monks' influence that they gained popularity in Japan. And so that's why we're highlighting them in one particular section of this exhibition. They were known in Japan before the Obaku monks, but their identity became quite fused with that of the Obaku monks, whose fortitude and strength to leave China at a very difficult time and set up this whole new um, sect of Buddhism in Japan in the early modern period shows their bravery and they were very educated and they um, inspired the Japanese and there were so many lay practitioners of Buddhism at that time and that's why I think the Rakan were uh, of interest to these uh, people in the early modern period and they were able, they identified them with the monks. So they were thinking, oh, these monks are rakan in disguise, walking around amongst everyday people. And then the last section of our exhibition is um, about obaku, traces of obaku. Um, so there are elements of um, uh, the temples themselves, like the placards that you see in the above the temple built name, the names of the temple buildings, and also images that artists did of the temples themselves. And so we're casting a much wider net of what is inclusive in an obaku exhibition than what was done in that very small exhibition so many decades ago. And the exhibition that, that we are doing here online with you at the University of Arizona is also going to have some new sections added to it eventually. Um, we're working on that and new art swapped eventually for some of the art online. And one of the new sections will be about the Sencha tea ceremony and its evolution. So, uh, so I hope that viewers will uh, uh, keep checking back for updates on this exhibition. Yeah, yeah. It's well said. It's really lots of good ideas and the thoughts 
And uh, for us, as uh, if we can call us uh, Obaku scholars, this is a, a dream comes true, right? Yeah. So because it's, uh, for, for this kind of a 350th uh, death anniversary, it's only celebration every 50 years, right? Yeah. So I feel the obligation to put on this online exhibition. And uh, we're so glad and uh, uh, grateful for, for your participation. And also you, you pointed out something very important about the art exhibition or the nature of Obaku art because it's so comprehensive, so it's, it's inclusive. So I, I'm not the art historian. So as a lay person, I always try to understand what, what Obaku art represents, right? So if we ask this question, the nature of art, and here we have an Obaku art, it doesn't mean just a, uh, uh, a scroll, uh, a calligraphy, a painting, but however, it's a combination of lots of different kind of art objects, such as uh, tea utensils, for example, uh, including architecture, the tea rooms. And also, uh, you mentioned the plaque in the monastery. So we're talking about a package of experience, right? Uh, and also, I see from your book, like a face and a power in Japanese Buddhist art, your, your concept of art is much more broader than usual scholars, you, you talk about not just the visual arts, but however also the architecture, right? So you want to include all of those together. And, and, and here, uh, what, what do you think about the Obaku art, right? So anything kind of in a couple of sentences uh, tell us the kind of the nature of Obaku art? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, first of all, in Japan today, or in the world in general, when you think about what is religious art, art made, f what we consider art today, at the time it was made, it was not considered art. It was objects made to facilitate understanding of a religious doctrine. But it was only in the modern period, in the Enlightenment era, um, in the 19th century, really, that religious objects that were then ultimately put in, collected by art museums and private collectors who were Western art collectors, started putting them in art museums. So the whole idea of religious art is a modern concept. And in the pre-modern Japanese world also, there's this separation they, they, between things that were made for decoration or for secular purposes or for religious purposes. But obaku art, if I'm trying to define what that means, um, encompasses a wide range of materials from um, and obaku art and architecture and obaku visual culture, I think, is probably a better way to describe what, what we are doing and representing. And many um, departments of art history today are now calling them, in universities, are calling themselves departments of visual culture, or people who study art are visual culture specialists. Um, and so you have liturgical objects, objects made for use in ritual ceremonies. You have, and that includes calligraphy scrolls that would be hung at special occasions. And they have special uh, certain uh, sayings on them of koans or other, uh, sometimes poetry, that that wouldn't be for liturgical purposes. So that's a different, function. And then you also have icon paintings that are, even though Zen is thought to have no icons, that's not really true. And you have icon paintings and statues of the Buddha and Buddha's disciples that fill up temples. And then you have other things that monks make that are inspired by their devotions and their devotional practices. So there are many types of art that can be related to obaku and also more broadly thinking objects for the secular uh, senchati ceremony 
that are inspired by spiritual devotions, um, but aren't necessarily used in rituals for um, religious purposes. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes along with the way religion is practiced in Japan in general, that there isn't a clear-cut separation between religious practice and the secular world. And I think that's one of the defining features of Japanese religion in general, that the secular and religious spheres overlap. And while people do go to uh, lay practitioners or devotees would go to temples to practice and to uh, on special festival days or holidays or uh, for um, funeral purposes or something. They, the way they people live their lives is in very much influenced by the the spiritual religious doctrines that they are surrounded with uh, and grow up with and um, are in their lives are infused with it in a way that we in the West are not so much that we have a much more clear separation I think between our secular world and um, religious religious life. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's a process of uh, secularization, right? It happened in early modern Japan. And this also raises a very interesting question because you already told us this tradition actually came from China first, right? So yes. right now we have to recognize this becomes a Japanese tradition. So, so this Japanese transformation of the uh, Obaku tradition and coincided with the uh, secularization process? Is that a fair kind of a understanding? Yeah, I or? think so much of Japanese religious practice, especially as the population grew in the early modern period and the government, the shogunal government, required all citizens to register at Buddhist temples. And they did that to keep track of the populace, mm -hmm. but it also helped infuse a Buddhist sentiment in the population in mm -hmm. general. And you have pilgrimages and festivals being defining uh, features of Japanese religious practice. And so those are sort of quasi-religious practices. And um, that don't, doesn't relate directly to obaku, but some of these attitudes came out of Ming China, where lay Buddhist practitioners grew very important, and especially with the rise of the middle classes and more um, going to temples, and as the society became more affluent and also more well-educated and literate, that these ideas began to circulate more with the uh, spread of literacy and printed books mm -hmm. that happened in Ming China and also in early modern Japan as well. Yeah, so this uh, secularization uh, process uh, is also one of the themes in your book, uh, Face and the Power yes. in Japanese Buddhist uh, art. Uh, so that's a monumental work, it includes not just uh, early modern art, but also modern art. Right. Uh, do you want to talk about a little about a little bit about this book? Oh, okay, sure. Well, I um, I had a lot of fun writing that book, and I started out thinking it would just be about early modern religion. And there's a section in there on obaku, of course, because they were so important. But then uh, talking to the publisher about what they could market, and also about how to relate the early modern period to our world that we live in today, I thought it was really important to bring it up to the present and show how some of the values in Japanese religious practice today have been inherited from uh, the way Buddhism was practiced and the art was created in the early modern period. So, so that's what I, I did and I s traveled all over Japan to go to different sites that were really interesting to me um, to see religion in practice, in not only in the major urban centers of, 
of at that time, especially Kyoto, which had so many head sect temples, and Edo, uh, Tokyo today, which was where the capital of Ed, uh, Japan was in the early modern period. But out into the periphery, and what was the re relationship between the center and the periphery of Japan in regional centers? So, and, and there is quite a bit of, of traveling back and forth. And one of the places that I really enjoyed visiting was a temple um, called Honenji in um, Takamatsu City that was uh, established in the 17th century. And Kyoto Buddhist sculptors, for example, went there and sculpted it. And there's a big, uh, it's one of my favorite places, a big tableau of uh, the death of the Buddha, the Nehanzu scene, that um, is three-dimensional in sculpture, and Kyoto sculptors came and did that for them. And so many artists that worked at that time were syncretic in that they worked for not just one sect of Buddhism, but they were kind of itinerant. And one of the artists who worked there uh, was a who did paintings there was a painter who did paintings of Oba, for Obaku temples as well. So that was really interesting to me. And um, another really interesting site that is off the beaten track that I would recommend for people to go to is um, a temple in, um, out in uh, Hiroshima Prefecture. It's on a little island on Onomichi, it's called Kosanji, that was established in 1936 by an industrialist, a very wealthy man, and he did he established the temple as a memorial for his mother. He was a Shin Buddhist sect, so nothing to do with Obaku, but it was really interesting because he wanted to make it kind of a mini pilgrimage route. So he had architects and designers build little buildings that were imitation of old, other famous temples from other parts of Japan. Mm -hmm. And then in back of it, the part that was really exciting to me was up on the hill is a book, is a, is a site that a contemporary sculptor who's not necessarily a Buddhist sculptor, but he did this huge whole marble encased hillside called the Hill of Hope for the Future, um, Mirai Shin no Oka, and uh, that was completed uh, maybe 10 years ago or something. And he's been this sculptor who's based in Italy, is, he's Japanese, has been working on it for decades. So um, that's a really exciting place. So those are two really interesting places that normally one wouldn't go to, but I think they're very worth seeing. I can see this from your book. There are lots of illustrations and the pictures yeah. of the temple sites you have visited. Yeah. Right, that's great. Yeah. Well, highly recommended. Right? Thank so you this book very is much. very useful. Uh, so let's go back to your lecture today. Right? Okay. Because in the afternoon, you're going to give us a lecture about the Obaku and the Sencha. Right? Yes. It's a very important topic. I guess you have visited so many temples, you must have been to so many tea ceremony, Sencha tea ceremony. Yes. And, and can you give us some overview about the today's a lecture you're going to give us? Um, well, my lecture today is basically giving you an overview of the history of the development of the Sencha tea ceremony, but focusing especially on Mampukuji and Obaku monks' roles in uh, spearheading the development of this Sencha tea ceremony. And so that's basically what I'm going to talk about. And my introduction to Sencha was, as I said, through my dissertation topic. And I would just like to mention, especially um, when I first decided to write a book about the Sencha tea ceremony, I wanted to become involved with a particular uh, I wanted to learn more about it. I'm not a Sencha tea master. I've studied it enough to understand how the utensils are used and have some sense of you know, everything about the ceremony itself. But um, I'm not a, a tea master. I was introduced to a scholar named Oba Osamu, who was a scholar of 
imported Chinese books uh, in the early modern period. And he was at Kansai University. And so I, I was introduced to him. And as it turned out, he was related by marriage to the, the head of the Kagetsu An Sencha Tea School in Osaka, which is the oldest Sencha Tea School. And so he introduced to me to them, and that's where I really studied about uh, um, Sencha. And so I'm going to talk a lot about uh, Kagetsu An today I see, I and see. why that's so important. And there are other school, many other schools of Sencha, but, but when I f my first visit to Kagetsuam, they were so kind to me, and they took out and hung a portrait of their founder, uh, Tanaka Kakuo, um, for me. It was made in the 1830s, and I was so shocked to see that it was by Yamamoto Baietsu, who I had written my dissertation <laughs> on. Yeah. And on top of that, it had an inscription by an Obaku Mampukuji monk abbot. And I said, I am in the right place. Here it is. <laughs> so so that's, that's how I you know, got started on all this. So, well, how, how wonderful these uh, coincidences. Yeah, right? and I think scholarship is a lot like that. that yeah. you, it's, you just serendipitously find topics right. to study and through inquiry to people and networking, then you find new ways of approaching your topic. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is so surprised them. Uh, uh, I feel so surprised to learn you're actually introduced by Oba uh, Osamu. Oh, yeah. And, uh, because I use his work quite a lot. Oh, he yeah. was such a wonderful man. And I yeah, went and exactly. studied at, I had a Fulbright grant in 1991, and I studied at his institute. I, I see. I, I just finished a paper recently about the importation of a Buddhist books to Edo, Japan. Oh. So I, I consulted his work quite yeah, frequently. Yeah, he was, he yeah, was extensively. such a wonderful man. Yes, absolutely. And you know, our interest in Sencha, uh, in tea in general, is that we are collaborating with uh, Dr. Andrew Wells Center for Integrated Medicine. So tea has a therapeutic uh, medical kind of uh, uh, effect and we're very interested in the future we can promote a tea, tea study including a history and the culture of tea. Uh, so your uh, lecture is going to be very helpful for us right? oh, great. to get people's attention to the Sencha tradition because we know the matcha tradition is, yeah, is quite yeah. big, huge in Japan, but very little we know about the Sencha tradition. And one thing I'm not really going to focus on today because I don't have time in my lecture, <laughs> um, but it's in my book, that a fair number of Sencha practitioners who were promoting Sencha in the early modern period were doctors, medical doctors of Chinese medicine. See, okay. And so even back then they knew that it was, it had medicinal properties. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So let's drink more sencha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So this comes to the end of our interview, but at the end I always ask uh, our interviewees one question. The last question is, is personal to me because I, I try to write a book called uh, How Buddhism Changed world civilization. It's, huh. it's such a huge question, but I haven't finished the book, but I ask all the scholars, uh, Buddhist leaders about this question. Uh, if I ask this question to you, how Buddhist, uh, Buddhism changed the world civilization, what's your view? And also you see, uh, we, we have uh, a lot of different perspectives. People, some people said there's no relationship, no connection, right? And uh, somebody said uh, it's lots of connection. In this case about the Obaku art, art belongs to civilization. And it uh, looks like uh, the civilization, the flow of art from China to Japan and finally got established in Japan shows some kind of impact Buddhism has to uh, civilization. So, so what's your answer to that well, question? I'd like to just um, say something very briefly about the whole concept of Buddhist modernism. And one of the projects that I would like to work on, I've been trying to write about and I've been giving lectures on in the past few years, 
is about um, secular Buddhism and how non-denominational Buddhism has influenced the way artists think about art and uh, socially engaged Buddhism, I think is really important. And um, Buddhism naturally has a sense that we are all connected, that nature, people are, con are, are connected. And to, that's a theme that I've found running through many contemporary Japanese secular artists who are inspired by Buddhist devotions that they learned about as a child. And I think that Buddhism today has a very important role in the world because of its emphasis on interconnectedness and compassion, um, which are values that we really need and are so important in the world today and maybe can help alleviate some of world conflicts. Yeah. So. Okay, okay, that, that's very nice words. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I think our audience will appreciate uh, this interview as well. So I, we want to thank you again. And uh, this afternoon, we're going to all be there and listen to your uh, wonderful talk. Right? Thank you so much. And also, we want to thank our audience today. Uh, uh, please follow us if you're interested in our events. Uh, we have a website at cbs.arizona.edu and also we have uh, social media on Facebook, Instagram, and also Twitter. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Yeah. yeah.